But I'd like to introduce and again to continue our theme of Dr. Woodson's uh, lines of effort. Um, and we talk about strategic partnerships. And, and really when you think about it in the purest context, um, you know, strategic partnerships, uh, you know, with our, 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 our civilian colleagues for medical training and, and, and with our civilian colleagues for uh, research and development. But, uh, you know, I, I started thinking about it for a while and I said, you know what, uh, what about the operational execution of our strategic partners, okay? And, and I, I thought that would be interesting, again, to bring in one of our NATO colleagues uh, and, and, and to kind of give, this ought to be probably your first uh, outbrief of, of our most recent uh, bilateral exercise here in the UK. And we recently had an exercise called Atlantic Serpent. Okay, when you talk about strategic partnerships, you talk about interoperability, you talk about what, what we do and why we do it. Uh, well, one of the shining examples of uh, of again making a difference uh, from a coalition perspective, of, of, of course, you know when you think about uh, the opportunities we had uh, most recently in Afghanistan with Canada, Kahar, with U.S. Uh, and the Dutch, and the U.S. and the Canadians, and then of course uh, uh, in Bastion uh, with the U.S. and uh, with the U.K. and and so uh, uh, the uh, U.K.S.G. Uh, uh, decided that, you know, we can't lose that. We can't lose that capability, but more importantly, we can't lose that, that momentum. And so I, I would argue without, with the conflict not even being over, uh, you know, said, hey, uh, you know, I'm going to put my money on the table and, and I want to, to, to validate, uh, uh, one, the continued concepts of, of, of what kind of what I call co-locating or embedding uh, U.S. in the bastion uh, and say, hey, let's, let's, let's do a, an annual or, or at least every other two years exercise where we continue to partner and continue those relationships. And so, so um, we're, we're, we're going to kind of get an insight on how that first exercise go, but more importantly, talk about what, what we need to do in the future. So again, with, uh, again, with, with, uh, with great uh, esteem, I, I would like to, uh, to uh, again, introduce uh, Surgeon Rear Admiral uh, Alistair Walker. Uh, who's the director of the medical policy, as you can see up there, and operational capability headquarters uh, for the Surgeon General there in the UK. So welcome, welcome. General Rob, thank you very much for your kind words. Do you want, if you, if you want, do you want me to do your slides or do you want to do I'm, them? I'm, you got I'm, them? Okay. I've got them. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here and I, I think um, you know, on, on behalf of all Remember of us. it's the right button, not the left like in your country? Yeah, but it's not my wife driving, it's all right. <laughs> um, no, it's a pleasure from the international delegates to um, thank you for your hospitality over here, and um, it, it's, it's been great. Um, strategic partnership in action. Just, just before we go, I, I don't own anything here in the Washington Conference Center. I don't own AMSYS. I have no shares in anything, so that's the disclosure <laughs> done. Um, Let's look at the scope of where we are, where we're going, uh, and just a little look at global strategic trends, health-related issues, and partnership in action. So where are we now? Bastion closed very recently, but I think that was a marvelous example of coalition partnership. But if you remember, it took some time to get there. It didn't just happen overnight. But by the time we closed out of this year, it was multinational, UK, US, Danish, Estonian, other people all contributing. And these people all got on well together. They worked hard together. And because of that, they got to know each other and they got to know each other's cultures. And because of that, the output was excellent. And we all know how well that's happened. But we also know how quickly that can fade. So Bastion's now closed. It was excellent cooperation. And we used Mission Pacific training. And we brought US people to our training center at Strensel, New York, so that they prepared to go out there. They met their UK colleagues. They got to know them 
And so before they actually deployed, they began to understand some of the rather strange eccentricities of the uh, British uh, in terms of terminology, drug terminology, and other sorts of things. And this minimization of issues with culture, nomenclature, equipment, subtly different staff capabilities, nuances of difference in care provision, all get ironed out and smoothed out so that the output is optimized. And the command teams get integrated and they get to know each other and they work together closely. So we train hard and we fight hard. And I would say we train hard, we train together and we fight hard. And that's the best output that we can get. This is worrying. Ah, where are we going? Right side of the road here, remember? Yeah. Um, the, 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 there is no going to be no reduction in world unrest. It may not be state on state, but different groups will lead to world instability. So if you think it's going to get quieter, I don't think it is. Climate change will drive this rapid population growth in some areas, and of course the challenges of energy and water uh, in, in many areas. You only have to go down to southern Turkey and see the big rivers dammed, and you wonder what's happening downstream in Syria, Iraq, and places like that. You can just see the issues growing. And there's a resurgence in ideology around the world power shifts from east to west, or west to east, sorry. Change happening all the time. And suddenly greater humanitarian requirements, and we've seen that especially in the recent West African um, situation. Technology is accelerating, and whatever we produce will not be as luxurious, and I use that word deliberately, because what we had in Afghanistan in a fixed long-term conflict will not be what we have in the future. So we've got to learn to train together in a different environment and a different geography. Here's the UK position at the present moment. We will remain a globally linked trading nation. That's important because we see ourselves as part of a larger world and with membership of key institutions be it the UN Security Council, be it the G5 nations, we see ourselves as playing in that. And to play in that arena, we have to stand up, and we have to stand up beside our coalition partners, such as the US. Defense for the UK will remain the nation's insurance policy. Well, as I said, near peer state on state threats are unlikely in the future. We have to realize as well that financial resources are finite. The, the UK government has an election in 2015. There will be a new government. It may be the same party, but it will be a different government. And the financial pressures remain very strong. The government has committed to health and education, but defense is not necessarily sacrosanct. But despite that, defense will remain part of UK's response along with economic and diplomatic levers. But we will usually act with allies and partners rather than as an individual. I see it unlikely, unless it's a very small uh, intervention, that we won't be part of some coalition if there are other future uh, conflicts. So we've had to redesign the UK Defence Medical Services, and I listened to my French colleague speaking earlier on at a different um, venue here, um, and it was very similar. SDSR is a Strategic Defence and Security Review. It happens now by Parliament every five years. The challenge was in 2010, which was the first of these major five yearly reviews. The solution was Defence Medical Services 2020, which led to a 12% cut in our um, manpower, 
reduction in bud budgets and a realignment uh, of, of some of the um, areas that we were going to work in. We also have increased reliance on reserve forces and the result should be a defense medical services capable of delivering a deployed medical force, force generation, and firm-based medical care. And often that firm-based medical care gets left off the political agenda. And actually, it's the most important part to generate our people for the future. So let's talk a little bit about the Ebola crisis. I talked earlier uh, this morning, but uh, it was... Um, the NATO HQ Allied Commander Transformation, who said this, um, 2013, quite a lot of foresight there. I don't think in the Ebola crisis, and I said this this morning, that we've really joined up strategically and internationally. I think because it's been a humanitarian uh, effort that we've forgotten to get the high-level strategic um, intent joined up between the French, the UK, and, and the US as the major partners in the three major countries in West Africa. I don't think that's happened to the level that it could have happened. I think we could have done things better, but other people may disagree. Um, there remains a risk of state instability and government health care failure within these areas, which we've all got to deal with within uh, Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone. And inevitably, whether it's driven by USAID or Department for International Development in the UK, military medical resources are going to be used. And I sit in meetings, and it's quite clear that who's going to do this? The military. Homeland security issues may get worse, and the military may be called into that. Um, and we've got to adapt force protection measures to combat existing and other emerging infectious diseases. So there's a challenge that we all are being offered here, whether we're American, whether we're British, whether we're French, whether we're Canadian, whoever. So we need a commonality of direction, equipment, and training to try and counter these problems. The air transport uh, isolators are a good example. There's a few around the world that are different, but they don't all match up. And do they actually dock into major uh, treatment centers in continental um, US or in Europe or wherever? So, you know, can we not do something a bit more collectively in that area? Some of the protocols for treatment are subtly different. Perhaps we can actually get together and develop these in a better manner. And have we got an overarching evacuation policy? I think it's a little bit sort of ad hoc. Depends on which country you belong to. There's different policies there. And I think that causes confusion to the international healthcare worker community. So Ebel is a good example of how I think we could probably get a bit more closer together. I know there's a lot of liaison going, I know there's a lot of discussion going, but I think it could be better. As we move out into contingency, we have to be aware that the training bill doubles. We're not going to be spending the money necessarily on the uh, operational scenarios to the same extent, but the training bill has to go up. So we can't let our lords and masters reduce our training and we need to regenerate contingent equipment um, for the first time in my career we have actually managed to take back most of the equipment that we had in Afghanistan I can tell you eight million pounds worth of equipment has come back to UK to be redistributed there were losses of 458 pounds it was as accurate as that and there are still 16 bits of equipment out of many thousands outstanding. So we've done well this time, but we don't do that every time. And I know that when we moved out of Iraq, we lost a huge amount of money and equipment. Force elements at readiness will need to be increased to meet the unknown threats. The unknown unknown, that we don't know what's going to happen around the corner. We need to have people ready to uh, counter that. The medical CIS 
resilience needs to be developed, especially in the transatlantic sort of area, so that we actually can talk to each other and, and, and work better, I think. And our doctrine needs to be mapped to global strategic threats. And the perhaps areas that we can just merge our doctrinal approach a little bit more uh, and make things a bit more together than it is at the present moment. It's not bad, but there's more we could do. And our establishments need to be reconfigured. And as we're all under pressure to reduce numbers, to make savings, then perhaps there are areas that we can work together to our mutual benefits. And the infrastructure needs to be reset to contingency, not to a bastion or an Afghani-like situation. And I think you know, there's a lot of people that say, well, we'll just build another big hospital. It's never going to happen in the same way, in my view. I talked about the recovery of the equipment from Afghanistan. What about our reserve forces? And this is where we are in the UK, and there are similarities with other countries I've been speaking to. We need an additional, round about 1650 reserves from across the UK. This is not going to be easy, and this is to counter the loss in regular forces. It's one of my headaches. Is that just for medical, or is that, that just medical? That's just medical. Just medical. That's just medical, because the medical component of reserves is significantly more than the medical component of regulars because we run field hospitals out of reserves. 38% um, of total defense medical services liability will be reservist, so over a third. And put the other way around, DMS reserves make up 13% of the reserve total liability. So proportionately, our reserves, in terms of the whole force in reserves, are a greater component than in the regulars. And we know that the regulars and reserves are working side by side in our National Health Service, but then there's competition uh, and there's areas where if we draw regulars and reserves at the same time, we can denude the home hospitals um, because we don't have military hospitals now and cause problems. Um, We've had operational testing. We've proven that reserves work both in Afghanistan and exercises involving the very high readiness hospitals. So although sustainable in the present scenario, what of the future? There are opportunities, but there are challenges. The reserves tend to be slightly older and the contingency planning is not as easy and the demographic picture and the demographic changes that we're seeing around the globe, we really have to be cleverer to remember that we've got to become attractive to uh, increasingly female workforce, a workforce that is aging, and a workforce that is multi-ethnic. And we don't attract necessarily enough people from the different ethnicities in UK. That's a problem. How do we maintain the clinical skill sets? Well, the direction within the National Health Service, it's the same in many places, is to increase specialization. But what we require is generalists. And you have the same problems. We require generalists because we cannot afford to have uh, people with lots of different skill sets. And the skill sets for operational deployment may be subtly different than the skill sets that are required uh, in, in the home base uh, hospitals. And we've got to somehow or other rationalize that. And I think that's an issue that across the whole uh, international community we need to think about. And we have this emerging specialty area, pre-hospital emergency medicine. So the guys that are before the front door of the hospital, they're not primary physicians, they're actually specialists in that right. And how do we, de how do we develop that because that's where we'll get best uh, bang for our bucks, I think, in, in future survivability. But in the UK, we have limited numbers of helicopter emergency services. Do we put people there? Do we put them on road services? You know, we can share issues 
across the international community to try and help work that out. And there is a question of leadership. Um, it's not necessarily very good within our national health service at times. There's a lot of management, but not much leadership at times. Um, and can we contribute more to the international sphere by developing our leadership programs? And, and finally, team training. And I mean team training across the international gambit uh, to get people used to working together. There's a whole generation of surgeons, anaesthetists, physicians, nurses, a, 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 a huge number of people that have worked together several times perhaps in Afghanistan and Iraq. They've got to know each other. They understand the quirkiness of international differences. And they've made friendships. And they meet their international colleagues and they say, hi, it's good to see you again, blah, blah, blah. And within a few minutes, they're back to where they were, and, and it works. Within two to three years, that will have gone, unless we do something about it. These relationships that we've developed, which are strong and vibrant, will go. So we need to exercise together, need to work together to keep that. So a new generation of people that have not been in Afghanistan, that have not been in Iraq, get to know each other and work together and work together uh, in, in a vibrant manner. So, this is my view. What do we need to do about this? We need communication, communication, and more communication. We need to talk to our, each other. We need to tell each other what we're doing. We need to compare, we need to contrast, and we need to take the best out of each of our systems, accepting that they're subtly different, but the best thing is out so that we really work together. And we can only do that by talking. I worry that over time, the relationships just begin to fade away a little bit. They're not as strong as they were, and so that communication fails. And that's not just UK, US, it's, uh, it's with all the other nations as well. The U US president and the UK prime minister met some years ago. They set up a joint task force out of which came four and then five different working groups so that we could compare and contrast different elements of US, UK working. And the fifth group was to look at interoperability and that's doing very well. Mental health was another group, family care, another group, uh, and warrior transition or rehabilitation. I think some of them have done their time, and I think we need to revitalize these. But I think the principle of having these bilateral, probably twice yearly talks and discussions, and then some actions out of that it, it is good. If we just talk and nothing happens, happens of it, that's a waste of time. But if we get some actions, it's good. Um, General mentioned Atlantic Serpent. I think that was a very successful joint UK-US exercise. I think people enjoyed it. I think there was definite benefit from it. I haven't seen the final report personally yet, but I, you know, all the feedback is very, very positive. Now, we could do it next year or the year after. I think if you leave it any longer than two years, right. you're in problems. Because again, these relationships have died and the people won't know what it is and it just won't work. So I think bilateral, well-planned, effective, productive medical exercises uh, are worthwhile. And so we prevent this knowledge fade in this joint interoperable environment. I think if we lose that, then we might as well go back to where we were 20 years ago. The other area I think that's important is joint research. Our guys that have come across to the US to research down in San Antonio and other places have really enjoyed that. They've enjoyed the vibrant community. They've shared work. We've done a lot of joint work where it's not been UK, not been US, it's just been us together. And out of that, we have changed doctrine, and we've influenced doctrine, and we've influenced doctrine on both sides uh, and, and developed joint policies as a consequence. And I think that's good and that's strong. I think it's also good for our up-and-coming, very young, very able junior physicians to do this 
because it gives them some excitement at a time where they don't perhaps have the trauma excitement of Afghanistan and Iraq. So I really support joint research and I really support guys coming across to UK as well. And then if we're doing the joint research, we're doing the joint training, we share protocols. Now, there may be subtle differences for good reasons because of the environment and because of the backgrounds that we come from, but where possible. And our policy now in UK is to take NATO protocols as our primary protocol and rather than national protocols. Now, we might seek individually to influence the NATO protocol, that's important, um, but NATO will have primacy over our own things. And we need to share the lessons identified and we need to prevent duplication of effort in this financially challenging uh, times that we're in. And the end thing is mutual trust. Because if we trust each other, we'll work together in the future, and we'll work together well. Um, we have that at the present moment. Don't let it fade. So that's my view. That's my view of joint in properly from a UK perspective. Um, it's a case of what price is the insurance policy? How much are governments willing to invest in their future medical capabilities? Uh, and how much can we bring them together? So thank you very much indeed. We have time for a few questions. So while you're thinking, um, I got a couple comments. So um, I, I you know, when I look at our ability to, in going off your last two slides, to, to translate um, the continued partnership, you know, we've laid the foundation on three or four accounts that I think uh, uh, when you collectively put them together, um, and, and, and we'll, we're, we're going to see some incredible fruits from our endeavors. Number one is um, the NATO Trauma Registry. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you think about about the continuing to to uh, have those communities of of of, of practice worked together, um, you know these guys finally beat it in my head. It's all about the data, you know, and so so I think that laid the foundation for an enduring partnership, okay, along the trauma communities, and mm -hmm. so so you know that's and that will withstand the test of. Relationships that will that will that will bridge all. Number two is um, on the short term, but I think will carry over. Is you talked about mutual trust. Uh, you know there was no better example of mutual trust uh, in my entire career than what happened in Kandahar uh, with the U.S. and the Canadians and the Dutch, and what happened in Bastion again with the Canadians, the U.S. and the U.K. and and so how do you continue to um, germinate that trust uh, is precisely when you all took the lead with this Atlantic Circle, okay? I, I, the, war, the damn war ain't even over yet, and you're already exercising what's it going to look like next. And for folks that, let me give you a little bit of how, how important Atlantic Serpent is, and we sat in a couple back rooms over the last year, year and a half, and kind of forged this. UK volunteered to host it first. Uh, and the reason is because you want to get the wedge in the door so that that's your comp your company <laughs> your government um, while there was still money uh, you say hey it's this important so then if you get your foot in the door then you got a chance of getting the money later so they said we'll host it first but it was it wasn't the US bringing their equipment and the UK bringing their equipment and setting up next to each other it was doing exactly what we did at Bash in Kandahar it was the US came in and embedded a cash personnel unit, part of the cash, embedded it in your theater hospital, okay? And it was the U.S., uh, I think we used the, uh, the TAC, the Tactical Critical Care Transport, and some AES, and embedded it inside your medical evacuation and your air medical evacuation, because that's really the wave of the future. It's, you know, that's true interoperability when you can embed yourselves, mm -hmm. and again, what I call seamlessly back and forth. So, so I applaud your leadership, and I applaud Again, uh, your, your SG's uh, vision on that. Mm. And so what you look at is next year, uh, we're already starting the planning, uh, we'll host it here. And I, and I told them they got a choice of one or two hell holes. 
you know, 29 Palms or Ford Polk? Which one do you want? You know, and so, but again, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's getting, and they'll come over, and they'll come over with their personnel, save cost, and drop them in on our equipment, just like we did, yep. and, and drop it in, in again, on our operations. And so I think that, that will do a lot, again, to, to, to one, continue that trust. And then there's a third piece out there um, that I think is a foundational element, and I, and I brought this up when we started talking. You talked about the global response but, uh, to Ebola, but in the background on patient transportation, and I reminded some folks, I had to call my buddies up there at, at uh, AMC and said, listen, don't forget, we already have a written agreement that we can and we will fly each other's equipment and each other's personnel on our air medical evacuation, UK, US, and Canada with our interfly agreement, okay? So that, you know, that there will, will not be a problem with us doing that if the decision is made politically that we're gonna fly those patients. So we've already laid the groundwork. Again, that, that lay down in war, but will be enduring for all global yep. conflict response from this point on. So it's a pretty exciting stuff going on out there. Again, the bilateral relationship to UK, US, and Canada, and, and again, thinking ahead, laying the groundwork for enduring, keeping the pilot light burning, and again, as, as we talked about, keep the keeper of the scrolls. You bet. Any, you know, uh, any uh, questions out there? You know, for, for those, of, those of us that are gray beards and, um, you know, might not be about for the next 20 years or so, or, or certainly won't be in the organization, we've been long retired, th there is just a little bit of sort of poetry here. To those who follow after, who fill the place we fill, who come with shout and laughter for hours that shall be still, we trust this sacred mission Pray God when we are gone, they raise the high tradition and pass it glorious on. Yes. We look to the future, the people that are coming behind us, to maintain the standards and things that we want to set at the present moment. Yeah. And that's vital. Thank Light you. Lighton. Uh, we had a question in the back. You bet. I'm not sure that you can hear me without the microphone. <laughs> Normally we could, but he's a little <laughs> hoarse. He's been gone for a while. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, Jim Zarnick again, sir, I, caught, I, I apologize, I caught just the end of your uh, lecture because I thought it was going to be at four, so you're running ahead, which is uh, well done. Um, so the, the, this concept of maintaining interoperability, absolutely, it's in our minds, we need to maintain it. The reality is we, uh, we need to develop a multinational, right? we're starting with three, but I will get, again just use the current issue of Ebola. As I was on the ground, I had four different nations come to me and say, Jim, we don't need to all build our own role too. Can we put people in your facility to do some burden sharing so that we can all also have access to it? And so it was the Germans and the Swiss, and it just, it went on and on. And, the, and I said, this absolutely makes sense it will sustain this that's mindset, but there was no paradigm, if you will, for us to fall in, no coalition framework, if you will. And uh, the second piece I would say is, remember that at least from the NATO construct, the NATO soft headquarters is doing this same, special operations forces, this same type of working together as well, and we would be remiss if we did an exercise without pulling them in because in the future they will also be a big part of this as well. Thank you, sir. I, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, I, I do think, though, that if we're going to work in multinational groups, that one of the nations has to be the lead nation right. and has to take right. that lead. I, it, it doesn't matter who it is, but uh, and that's the standard we're going to set. We're the lead nation. That's how we're all going to work together. Because otherwise, you'll get sort of mismatch and, and whose standards, are, whose protocols, who's the, yeah. So there has to be a lead nation. But thank you. Right, I think that's a good lead in the discussion you know, I had was lead nation, but then the whole concept of smart defense and modularity that NATO and, 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 and also the UK is also following me, maybe give them a little bit of background on that. Smart defense, NATO, well, modularity. I think mod modularity, uh, important. And I think, um, you know, we're looking more and more to develop our 
processes in a modular fashion, and there always was a degree of modularity, but I think it could be better than it actually is. I'd, and, and then there can be interoperability across the nations on that modular basis. Um, I think it's going to take a bit of work to get there um, because you know, it's, it's difficult enough within your own nation to get a sort of agreement on what the modules are going to have and how it's going to work and, and how it's all going to join together. But I think that's the direction of change and direction of travel that we should be taking. Uh, and uh, NATO is difficult because you know, in um, West Africa, it's not a NATO mission. Um, NATO, it, they see it as the United Nations World Health Organization. So in this humanitarian sort of arena, things might be subtly different. But on the other hand, that brings in other nations that are not part of NATO that could each equally contribute. So we mustn't sort of just say, well, we're purely NATO. We must think slightly wider than that. How are we going to work with the Cubans and other, you know, Chinese? Yeah. Chinese. Chinese were asking to do the same thing exactly. in West Africa. And may I be so bold that the answer is yes, I will. Um, <laughs> could you speak of this also, not so much from the role three standpoint, if you will, but we know that the, no, no kidding, the data shows that the area where we will make the greatest impact on mortality on the battlefield is in the pre-hospital arena. Yep. And so what we really need to demonstrate here is an interoperability for the forward medic or the patrol medic, and then also to enhance in peacetime their sustainment training for what we no kidding need them to do, not what our medical standards in the city tell us they quote are legal to do, but what they need to do to keep people alive. I want to make a comment. I, I, I agree with you, and I think you know, there is, and, and Tom would agree, there is some interoperability here that, and some research work we're doing, Reboa, things like that, which may have an effect further forwards. I think it's, it's more difficult uh, because our paramedic training programs may be subtly different, but I think within the military we can coalesce the best elements to give these people a much better pathway. We're looking in UK at redeveloping the whole defence medic concept um, because previously it has been very single service but you can just have a common core pathway that everybody really does whether you're army air force or navy and then you can bolt on some of the maritime or the uh, air elements you know on top of that and then you can raise the standard and bar and also give these people some sort of recognition of a qualification that is not normally recognized within civilian practice but actually they deserve because they are doing something and I think to be fair within civilian practice there is a bit better hearing of that I don't know what it's like in US but in UK I think it's better better hearing than there was 10 15 years ago so I think there's an opportunity there uh, and certainly we're keen to do that and next year the pilot will start for the new defense medic program and we'll see how that goes. Good. All right. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.